Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Talking in the Free World, Canada's McDonald Laurie Institute. I'm Miriam Mimar Sadegi. My guest today is Nuri Turkle. Um, <clears throat> Nuri, welcome to the program. Thank you, Miriam. Yes, let me introduce you. Uh, Nuri is a, a global leader for the Uyghur people who are being systematically persecuted by China's Communist Party that is affecting potentially uh, millions of Uyghurs. Uh, he is the author of uh, No Escape, which has uh, come out just recently. Uh, one of the best things I've read in a very, very long time and uh, highly recommended. Um, aside from the fact that it's uh, uh, the truth about something I can't think of anything more important that's happening in the world, perhaps other than the war in, in Ukraine, as far as the human rights situation is concerned. Um, it is a, a riveting read, beautifully written. Uh, Nuri Turkel is, um, as I mentioned, a global advocate for the Uyghur people. He has just written this book. It's just published. He's a uh, vice chair for the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. He is chair of the Uyghur Human Rights Project, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, an accomplished attorney, an essayist, uh, provides commentary on uh, TV and radio uh, across the world. He is um, Times uh, Top 100 People in 2020, in 2021, Fortune Top 50 Leaders. And as I mentioned, he's a beautiful writer. So, um, Nuri, thank you for giving us your time again. Let me just say as we, as we start the interview that about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, um, I arranged for an interview with uh, Re Rebecca, Rabia Kadir, uh, uh, one of your most um, uh, recognized leaders of the Uyghur community for uh, Tavana, a project which uh, reaches uh, millions of Iranians inside the country. And her story, of course, the example of her leadership, her sacrifice for her people was um, just astounding to me. And um, so let me begin by asking you about your own childhood. Could you tell us about how you were born and how you came to be so personally motivated? Thank you very much, Miriam. I appreciate your kind words about the book. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with your um, listeners. Um, I was born in a, in a re-education camp during the height of the uh, Cultural Revolution uh, in China. Um, my young mother was detained because of her connection to her own father, killed by association, that authoritarian regime around the world, even today, uh, Russia, uh, Iran, China, often used to scare, uh, intimidate, uh, punish family members for something that doesn't really have anything to do with that individual. So my, my mother was taken into the re-education camp. She was pregnant with me at the time. She was subject to verbal and physical abuses and uh, injured uh, uh, during the early parts of her incarceration. And she delivered me uh, while she was injured, um, uh, cast uh, while she was in cast chest down. Um, and we spent um, uh, the next several months uh, after I was born together in this re-education camp. To make the matter worse, um, uh, my dad was also dragged into other type of camp, which was a labor camp uh, three hours away from the uh, city of Kashgar. Um, and he was uh, forced to go through, forced to perform agricultural labor. So my um, the way that I was born to this world and my early childhood experience um, living, uh, growing up in, in the heart of Central Asia, uh, in a city where is, uh, where that has, uh, what is in a city, which is, uh, regarded as a cradle of a Uyghur civilization, uh, giving me a sense of, uh, Uyghurness as I grow up, um, I was able to enjoy some of the basic things such as following my dad to go to mosque during the important uh, religious holidays, uh, spent a lot of time with our extended family members. Um, and also I was able to speak my language. I still speak uh, fluent uh, Uyghur language. Uh, 
and I was educated in the Uyghur educational system, uh, being able to use. So those are the kind of things that are taken away from the Uyghur people even today. So, and then um, as for um, my um, early activism life in the United States, had a lot to do with the international environment, 9-11 uh, to be exact. I'd be happy to discuss in bit, a bit in uh, details uh, as we go along. Yes, I know that after 9-11, you immediately thought that how this is going to negatively impact your people because the excuse for countering uh, radical Islam would be used to, um, you know, double down, if you will, on the already existing uh, repression of the Uyghurs who are uh, who are Muslim or predominantly Muslim, I assume. Um, so um, you've written this book. Your parents are still in China. One of the most um, uh, compelling parts of your story uh, for me was knowing that you know how much in your in, in your entire life how much uh, you may be risking the the safety and well-being of your loved ones back in um, East Turkestan, uh, as you call it, or uh, yeah, and and yet you continue. So can you talk talk a bit about what you fear now? Or uh, now that you have published this book, or you you know you mentioned also that by speaking out, you actually created a level of protection for them. Um, can you talk a bit about that? How do you see the level of uh, insecurity because of your work? You know, transnational repression is 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 actually getting worse, uh, even in our home country now, my adopted country, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, but I refuse to live in fear. Uh, speaking, uh, speaking out on behalf of millions of Uyghur uh, people who have been taken to the camp for no apparent reason other than being Uyghur and just Muslim, uh, to me, it's outrageous. Uh, even if I did not have family ties uh, or genetic ties to the Uyghur people, I would yeah. have spoken out uh, because this is, the, you know, as a, as a student of history. I always believe in um, something very, very basic that no one should be punished uh, or subject to genocide, acts of genocide because of that person's ethnicity and, or religion or both. Um, I thought that never again meant something to the international yeah. community. And I, I just turned, it's just becoming an empty promise today. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very dangerous uh, when you deal with regimes like the one in Beijing, in Tehran, Moscow, or elsewhere. Uh, they're so petty and they're so brutal. They can uh, inflict uh, both emotional and physical harm. But, it, you know, this is a particular time. Um, those of us who work in the human rights uh, field, always feel, uh, have something looming over our heads. Uh, as I describe in the book, the reason that I call it no escape is because I, I as, as a American citizen, and I'm also US official, um, uh, have uh, been a, appointed by Congress to serve it, um, at the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. So with that, I still don't feel that I'm, I, am, I am fully free. This needs to be talked about. That's so wrong. And I should not be calling myself half free or partly free person, even being free physically. But the threat is always there. You got to just, you got to keep doing what you're doing because it's empowering. Um, speaking out for people that you don't even know uh, or not connected through your family um, uh, or even personal relationship, it's so empowering. I feel... I feel better, even though that I had to deal with this risk at work and this risky business. I yes. feel better that we have been impactful. Yes, through absolutely. Our collective efforts. Absolutely. So tell us what's happening to the Uyghur people. Uh, in particular, if you can talk about this concept of becoming family and the the digital dictatorship. I mean, I was struck by the fact that 
everything was it was so automated and remote and and depersonalized and yet at the same time so much bodily harm and so much just just pure brutishness so just uh, if you can an overview of exactly what what people are suffering there um it is it is impossible to um describe in a uh, simplest uh terms because this is something that the world has not seen since the Holocaust era. Yeah. I call this as a tech dictatorship or tech authoritarianism or tech genocide yeah. uh, for a specific reason. Just imagine essentially what you're living as an Orwellian surveillance state where any move, any thought, uh, any basic aspect of your life, identity, uh, past writing, uh, your family connection, uh, the way that you dress could lend you into a prison. Uh, foreign policy magazine uh, list, uh, profiled or translated the official uh, government document called it 48 ways that uh, you can lend you lend yourself into the prison camp mm. uh, where you will be, uh, where you have been uh, if you're detained, subject to constant brainwashing, Demand, demands of worshiping the state in Xi Jinping, uh, mm -hmm. food deprivation, unsanitary conditions, physical and sexual abuses, mental torture, uh, even potentially death. I, I, this, this death part may be a, may be a surprise to uh, most of you, uh, most of the people in free societies, uh, but we have been seeing uh, disturbing uh, news, uh, satellite images of um, crematoria. Uh, built around the uh, the camp or adjacent to the camps, so um, I I believe this is something that the international community can no longer ignore. I know that we have been consumed in the news uh, news regard involving Ukraine or yeah. Russia these days, but we cannot lose sight of of the other regime, uh, Xi Jinping, that is enabling a lot of bad actors around the world. Kim Jong Un the mullahs in Iran, or even Putin. Uh, he got a green light from Beijing before invading Ukraine. So uh, what is happening to the Uyghur people is not just another human rights crisis. You mentioned the technology aspect. The technology that's supposed to foster human, uh, foster, uh, you know, uh, 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 supposed to make our lives better or easier. But in the current environment, the technology has been uh, I would not use mis uh, the term misuse, but it's been purposefully used uh, yeah. for surveilling, harassing, enabling, facilitating uh, uh, the ongoing genocide. Uh, worse, the technology, very technology that Chinese developed, tested, utilized, and now in the process of being exported around the world. It's metastasizing. Chinese version of governance Chinese version of uh, a Chinese form of uh, surveillance. Now mm -hmm. it's been spreading around the world. Uh, more than 80 country and countries uh, reportedly have adopted the uh, Chinese surveillance technology. What does it mean? This is about uh -huh. privacy, uh, democratic freedom, national security. Uh, so I, I, I'd be happy to discuss further, but the technology aspect of the ongoing genocide is something that has not uh, get uh, hasn't been a uh, is not getting enough attention. Yeah, I mean, I think that it actually goes beyond Orwell, and it goes beyond a science fiction dystopic um, novels. What is what the reality of, of China is? Um, I can say that I had, you know, as somebody who tries to keep up with the human rights situation there, I had no idea that it was that it was this pervasive. I mean, basically people have no no right to a, a, a personal life or a home life. So can you talk about the becoming family concept also? Yes, um, even before this news was initially reported by uh, Dr. Uh, Darren Byler uh, in the long uh, piece that he wrote uh, early 2019, uh, the the Chinese um, government cadre, cadres, uh, Oprachek, showing up on the Uyghur families, harassing, uh, dining in, uh, sitting around and monitor their activities, family interactions, were something already in existence. But what is um, uh, harrowing, uh, it's almost 
you know, too graphic to describe um, is, is something that the, the media has been reporting. Uh, One million Chinese cadres have been sent to the Uyghur homes to live and eat uh, and sleep uh, Uyghur, with the Uyghur family members. Just imagine, just to wrap, this, wrap your head around this idea. Uh, we live in a society that people need to be invited to be at your house. Even if they just show up, you need to give a permission to enter your place of residence, let alone your dining table or bedroom. And the in this in this um, uh, the ongoing program that is designed and, and implemented by the Chinese state to essentially send a handpicked Han Chinese uh, officials, state employees, to go to Uyghur homes. Um, and specifically the Uyghur families that has no male household leader. Mm. So making the Uyghur woman uh, vulnerable. As I describe it in the book, one of the Chinese cadres who showed up in uh, one of my interviews, uh, camp survivors or camp teacher's house, even uh, molested her while her husband wasn't sitting in the living room. And even she, he was bragging about the others performing certain acts of pleasure while they were doing it. And also as a, fa other, as a parent uh, of a small children, young children, I can't imagine that somebody comes to my house and make my kids to spy on me. Yeah. Uh, and so it comes to my house uninvited, sleep in my bedroom, uh, yeah. eat in my dining room. As if that is not enough, using my kids to spy on my communication with my spouse. That that to me is is um, it should shock the conscience, you know. I so, so incredibly uh, invasive and brutal ways to turn families against each other. Kids are known to be honest, you know. They can tell what they see uh, if if their honest answer uh, answering questions such as "Do your parents pray at home? Do your parents tell you act speak certain way when we at your house?" That kind of answer, the, the, the honest answer, direct answer, frank answer, frank answer, could land a parent or parents into the, uh, the, to one of the camps. Uh, I, I, you know, I agree with the U.S. government's position. Uh, uh, one of the senior officials uh, what uh, you told me. And I'm sorry, Nuri, what is the U.S. government position? U U.S. government uh, initially called this as a genocide in the outgoing Trump administration in early 2021, genocide and crimes against humanity. The, the, uh, the aspect of what is happening in the, in the camp, that was more focused on that. But later, after Biden administration took office, during the annual human rights religious freedom uh, report release events, the officials essentially likened, uh, call it this, uh, as an open air prison uh, for the Uyghur people. Those yes. are the, the, the Uyghurs living outside of the camp. That includes your own family. Uh, speaking of uh, the digital uh, surveillance or surveillance techniques, they have a QR codes on the doors of the Uyghur families. This has been profiled. That they know who lives there, uh, what kind of uh, people coming in and out of the house. So it's everything is even profiled in your house. Um, so, so yeah, it is it is an open air prison for those who manage to stay out of the camps. But the camps is another um, uh, uh, another story. Uh, when we talk about a camp, people often think that this is just the one uh, re-education centers or uh, some sort of school that teaching um, mm -hmm. skill, but you don't teach. Um, uh, skills that are used in assembly line to a university professor, so that's yes. what the school essentially means. They have a uh, they have um, four types of camps being built and uh, operated today. One is the children's camp; they call it state orphanage. Yeah. Uh, New York Times reported at least eight hundred thousand Uyghur kids been taken in. This is one of the main factors for the United States government to call this as a genocide. The other yes. is the uh, labor camps. Uh, forced labor camps where they make uh, sneakers, uh, cotton shirts, sol solar panels, computer components, PPEs. And then and the these, third. These, these include for companies like Uniqlo and Adidas, things yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. These are the companies, these are, they, these include the companies that 
sponsored the genocide olympics in february yeah and then the third type is the concentration camp which is very similar as i described in the book i i spent substantial amount of time to study history of the uh concentration camps uh through this amazing book written by andrea pitzker so i i, I was disturbed to, to find the similarities between the uyghur camps and the nazi camps there's so much similar there's a third one is the actual prison camps where they have been sentencing individuals anywhere between 10 to 20 years for even as simple as writing a book i mean mostly these people are uyghur social elites this is also a surprising aspect of my research interview and writing for this uh, writing this book yeah uh, two things one so similar the concentration camps that i have um, described the other is how systematic uh, and abrasive that they initially attacked the Uyghur elites. And then the third one, so similar, is a purposeful, deliberate, uh, targeted attack on Uyghur women and children. Yeah. So those are the three things that through my research, uh, interviews uh, of uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, yeah. sitting through countless um, interviews, um, and I feel comfortable, you know, I mentioned the camp that I was born. That camp more, 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 more or less looked like the Stalin's gulags. Yeah. But the, this camp that we're talking about today more uh, has uh, shares a lot of resemblance with that of the Nazi camps. Sounds like it. Uh, Nuri, how do we know what we know? I mean, all of the what you just described, how how has this access um, happened? Uh, it, it sounds like it's possible that there's a lot happening that we might not know about. That's a great question. Um, I wish we have access to um, the region uh, like the other uh, crises that the world has seen. But uh, early on, um, as I profiled in a book, uh, a, a young student with a set of technical skills in Vancouver identified the camps through satellite images. Yeah. Uh, that's one, one way that we were able to find out. Uh, the other is leaked documents. It is the Chinese government that is actually providing a lot of uh, information uh, the forced sterilization, for example, the size. Why, why, of the why, why would the Chinese Communist Party put out this kind of information? Is it to normalize it, to say, oh, it's not that big? Purpose, the potential purpose. One is to uh, for domestic consumption. And then two, uh, try to normalize it. Uh, and then possibly a third is to convince their allies in the Muslim world that they, that they are doing something meaningful. Because most of the Chinese allies, no, they, they don't call it out. There's a, only one ally to the Chinese, that's North Korea, uh, supporters, uh, client states. They yes. wanted to see something that could be used as a uh, talking point. So, you know, uh, last year, the, uh, the Chinese uh, authorities put uh, three diplomats on their TV, uh, state TV, CGTN, uh, and they are from Pakistan, Palestine, and Syria. So they use this for, uh, for international uh, 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 information purposes to normalize it, as you perfectly po uh, pointed out. And then the other way that we were able to, uh, we have been able to know what's happening is through uh, witness testimony, mm -hmm. as I have, uh, as I have uh, profiled. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's some drone images being uh, uh, released, um, transporting a large number of Uyghurs uh, through trains to unknown locations. Uh, and, and after these information put out, the Chinese deleted the open source. Like it, uh, most of the uh, forced labor um, uh, factory sites and also the, the public bidding, uh, construction bidding uh, materials were all uh, public. They removed them. So because it, it just revealed. And also the uh, birth control, forced sterilization was also initially a public statement and there were at least two sets of leaked, leaked documents uh one is the china cable that icij um, uh, profiled and I, I in the beginning of my book i have a um, i have lines about in less than two weeks in about 10 days period the ijop integrated joint operating platform essentially ordered uh, police to arrest uh, 
twenty thousand Uyghurs. They couldn't find yeah. twenty thousand people. And this is on the China cable. Yeah. So this is all substantiate um, China cable as the leaked document that uh, British Panorama has also reported. Yeah. Before that, New York Times uh, leaked uh, four over four hundred pages long, uh, a, a top secret document uh, and, that so has been also been reported. Right. The list of 20,000 people that 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 were supposed to be uh, arrested, that list was automatically generated. Right. It was an artificial intelligence yeah. generated list yeah. of people. This is why I, I I'm calling through this book, calling world's attention to this menace being developed, tested, utilized and, and exported by Beijing. Yeah, it if, could be of the world if Any, we anywhere yeah. anywhere it could even happen here at home we yeah. got to be careful because uh miriam there's no regulatory mechanism yes around the world no one has a, a means and ways to control or govern these kind of um, uh, modern day uh technology support uh, tools to punish political dissent imagine that machine tells police to arrest uh, an X number of people, even yeah. police cannot locate that many people. Yeah. So this is this is a machine. This is a, a machine that collects personal data. I had the privilege to be part of this documentary called The Age of AI, produced by Frontline and broadcasted by Frontline, two hours long. In the beginning of this documentary, a person who is uh, regarded as the top expert on AI, artificial intelligence, says China is the new Saudi Arabia for personal data. So they, you know, we, 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 we rightfully concerned about our personal data being used for commercial purposes, namely Facebook, uh, Amazon does it as well. But in China, that's for more, more of a political purposes, in sure. addition to being commercialized. So yeah. even, even top AI expert accept, uh, uh, suggested uh, or said uh, openly that China has um, an, an edge on personal data. About yeah. a year ago, uh, a top national security experts published um, similar type of uh, essay or essay discussing uh, how uh, advanced the Chinese uh, way of collecting personal data. Yeah, and there's something that's becoming kind of accepted norm is, well, these are private companies. They can do what they want. But the thing is, when these private companies engage in this kind of behavior one when they're when they're operating within a repressive regime um like china's that can go be used for <laughs> all kinds of human rights abuses as, as you've described but also when that's the modus operandi of those companies well then if even in in countries of the free world when democracy uh loses its integrity, then that same data can be used for all kinds of nefarious purposes. Let me move on because I have so many questions for you. Um, so my, my, my last question is how do we how do we know what we do know? What are some ways that we might be able to improve our, our access or our ability to understand what's happening there? What are, what is what are some things that we're not doing that we should be we should be doing? I, you know, the, the in, initially, I, I, I forgot to mention one uh, other ways that we were able to learn about this was the journalists. There, are an, there were yeah. an army of uh, Western journalists from the BBC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, were allowed to go and, uh, and do, did reporting. Uh, I think it was 2020 or even 19, uh, Chinese uh, kicked out uh vast majority of the american journalists from china essentially just punishing so we should press uh the chinese authorities uh to allow journalists to return and do their job without the investigative journalism i can say this with certainty that the world would not know early on about these atrocities that can only be uh, verified through witness testimony satellite images and the open source government uh, documents. Yeah. And then two, um, uh, we should have, uh, we should demand, you cannot request something from the Chinese, we should demand unfettered access for independent uh, humanitarian organizations to, to, to see 
And now, you know, we're talking about this unfettered access. The UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, mm -hmm. has been, uh, quote unquote, negotiating, negotiating with the Chinese in the last two days, that uh, two years. I think that to me is, is this disgraceful uh, uh, situation. Yeah. Why would a UN agency have to wait for two years? I still not been confirmed. What is that? What do they do? What is the man? What is the UN mandate says? UN mandate specifically. I mean, UN essentially was established to protect and promote human rights. And to this day, uh, UN agencies, uh, particularly the the ones that are char in charge of uh, humanitarian uh, efforts and human human rights, specifically refugee resettlement, have been yeah. non-existence. The yeah. other way that we should also try. Wait. Let me just interrupt you for a second, since you're on the subject of the United Nations. Uh, can you talk just a tiny bit about this woman who is from Belarus, a supposed professor of peace, who is actually helping, uh, working for the United Nations, helping to whitewash this genocide of the Chinese Communist Party? And by the way, in parentheses, she has just visited Iran to... Uh, to try and get sanctions relief for that regime under the the rubric or auspices uh, aus auspices of uh, the United Nations. It, as as I pointed, the UN has been has been disgraceful, uh, and when you talk to them, even to this day, uh, Secretary General Guterres has not said a word. I was I was quite surprised mm -hmm. that he can talk. I saw him on TV screens when he was in Ukraine. I saw him walking around uh, damaged buildings and he spoke the language that I was hoping to hear. Yeah. To this day, nothing. Why? UN is essentially in the pockets of the Chinese government. Yeah. They pay uh, a big chunk of UN operational budget. This is where I, 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 I was trying to, uh, to, um, to suggest this earlier. Whenever the Western democracies retreat from uh, the international organizations, the vacuum mm -hmm. is filled by countries like or nations like uh, states like China. So no. we need to have a seat on the table. We need to. We it, it's it's good that we are always express a concern, express a frustrations. But at the same time, Western democracies like Canada, the United States, the UK, EU have to ask themselves, what have I done to make it make a difference? Uh, it's empty talk if you don't invest uh, enough time. I, you know, I just returned from Uzbekistan, and I sensed that they wanted to have a closer relationship with the West. But when was it the last time that Canadian Foreign Minister or U.S. Secretary of State even bothered to go to Central Asia? So, so these kind of things is is extremely important. It, it's it's good to have focus um, a specific co conversation about China, but at the same time, we got to do what we can do. So, um, to in the, uh, so the independent access is very important. You know, I profile the Red Cross access to the Nazi camps, uh, as you may recall on the book. And then the BBC goes, and then the now BBC is also banned. We should not let the journalists to to the journalists to suffer because of this regime and because of this regime's economic almighty economic power. That very economy that the West helped to build in China is actually being used against us. Why yeah. there's no progress uh, with certain countries? Why, for example, in Iran, Iran is the biggest uh, Chinese client state. They not only become an export destination, but the Iran is also using Chinese technology to beef up its domestic security apparatus. That is a dangerous proposition. That is a dangerous trend line for democracy activists or, or, or those activists in Iran uh, who cares for the future of the nation? We yes. have to talk. Yeah, the, the big player, the big elephant in the room in many countries are China, even in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, I don't mince words when it comes to Saudi Arabia. The, the MBS, the uh, future custodian of two holiest mosques for the Muslim people, goes to Beijing, pampers with unbelievable uh, compliments of Xi Jinping. Uh, for his treatment, quote unquote, treatment of the Uyghur Muslims, that's disgraceful, unconscionable. So, and, and then the same thing with the Pakistani former uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan. So, the money, technology, and their sense of, you know, pushback against the West. Some Muslim countries also using China 
for strategic purposes. Uh, they're essentially playing footsie with the Chinese to get attention from the Europe and from the United States. I think it's, okay. it's, it's a short-sighted, uh, naive approach. But um, that's a separate conversation for, for another day. But um, you essentially see China everywhere. The, everywhere that we have a problem with, uh, whether it be a human rights problem, whether it be a humanitarian crisis, whether, whether it be a um, uh, debt trap through the BRI, you see China. Okay, so the Chinese um, regime is a huge one. It's it's massive in terms of its if, of its global power, its footprint, both economically and politically. What is the best way for the free world to take them on? You know, as, uh, in my professional life, we identify issue before we do anything. Yeah. So the issue is um, we have this uh threat i feel comfortable calling a threat because it's affecting everybody's life um what do we do um number one we have to recognize that what we're dealing with especially for western governments i just it's incredible when you listen to some se serious policy makers serious government officials in europe in north america and elsewhere they treat this regime as a normal regime that's one thing that they need to uh, need to correct. It is not a norm. It's a communist party ruled state regime. Their domestic policies, foreign policy, national defense, uh, even the economic policies, all of it uh, centered around pa uh, communist party's interest. Uh -huh. it, uh, it is just it's mind boggling that some government officials, including my own here, uh, namely our climate uh, special envoy. John Kerry think that toning down on human rights mm. will make the Chinese to help in cli climate crisis. It's, mm. It doesn't work like that. The Chinese does what is best for them, specifically even in the interest of the Communist Party. Yeah, even uh, if it did work, even if we did get some climate change improvement because, <laughs> because we yeah. have to give up on the genocide issue. I mean, it's right. Absolutely. And then the second thing is that... Uh, this is has to be um, in a multilateral uh, 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 multilateral uh, uh, um, cooperation. the The United States has done its due. The Canadian Parliament did what it's supposed to be doing. The other parliaments have done it, um, but that's not enough. You know, uh, there are hundred, more than one hundred fifty state parties to the Genocide Convention. Only eight of them have spoken out. Mm. This has to be multilateral. This has to be global. It shouldn't be the matter for Canada, UK, or a handful of European countries in tandem with the United States to tackle. Yeah. This has, you know, if you sign on a treaty, you have a treaty obligation. If you right. don't fulfill your treaty obligation, one of the most effective tools that we have, the Genocide Convention, will eventually mm -hmm. become a meaningless. Yeah. That's, so the, that's a very important legal tool that we have. And yeah. then the third is um, we need to um, uh, use the uh, the power of the consumers. Uh, past uh, June, uh, past February, during the uh, Olympic Games, uh, the uh, the activists around the world call uh, for consumers to boycott the NBC broadcast. As a result, I think CBC is, has also suffered as along with the NBC. Uh -huh. Their viewership dropped significantly. So. Don't watch the genocide Olympic was a powerful message. And we yeah. alluded earlier, there are Visa, Coca-Cola, uh, Nike, Procter Gamble, Omega. Those are the official sponsors of the genocide Olympics. On, on, on top of being a company is being called out for using slave labor. So if the consumers step up to the plate, it ha two things will happen. The investors will notice. And it will create a bad public perception that will hurt the, the business. And then the boardrooms, corporate boardrooms, will start looking at a different approach. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know how long the international community, people in the free world, feel be okay to hug their babies wearing a baby pajamas made by a, a slave uh, human being. Absolutely. So consumer activism is so important. And the third, I want to see a global. Um, legislative actions like the way that we were able to put in place in the united states there are two pieces of legislation legislative mandate 
uh, been uh, uh, signed into law in the last two years. I'd like to see something in Canada and in, in Ottawa. I want to see something in Canberra and London. Uh, it has to be global. Okay, um, well, the, what you're talking about in terms of the economic pushback is voluntary actions by uh, consumers and voluntary actions taken by by companies who want to be more responsible. But, you know, as we're seeing with what the world is doing now to <laughs> and what the world to, to some extent uh, has been doing with Iran's regime is sanctioning the economy, really trying as much as possible to sanction the entire economy. Of course, not to, much, not to, to the effect that, that the free world desires because the price of oil has, has shot up and other reasons as well. What, what's your position on that? I mean, obviously it's not as easy to, to boycott or sanction the Chinese economy. What's your position on that? Well, I think it's coming. It, we already have sanctioned uh, Chinese economy. There are uh, more than 100 uh, uh, punitive sanctions been announced by both uh, Trump administration and Biden administration. That includes the largest um, uh, actor in the ongoing uh, forced labor practices, Xinjiang Production Construction Court, XPCC is the acronym. It's a pa paramilitary. Um, the, Ed State, uh, the Commerce Department has a large number of a long list of uh, entities being added to the entity list. Global Magnitsky sanction has been um, uh, imposed on the, on the Chinese entities. Um, here's the difference between the Iranian sanction and the Chinese sanction. Iranian sanction, yes, people on the ground have been hurt. This is why we get pushed back uh, oftentimes if the sanctions are, are effective. Sanctions shows effectiveness uh, as the time goes by. Even, even um, in, in the case of China, the two, two things are very important to the Chinese. One is the, uh, the public perception, how they are portrayed in the international uh, discourse. And then two is their economic interest. That very economic interest is actually creating a lot of problems around the world, as we alluded earlier. Uh, you know, the three C's coined by uh, uh, Australian policy expert John Garno, China's uh, influence operation around the world is uh, corrupt, corrosive, and coercive. So that money, that economic influence is helping that three C, uh, and it's creating a lot of problems uh, around the world. The healthy economic power won't do that. That's mm -hmm. the problem. And then uh, in order to get their attention, you have to make it costly. They, you know, when you listen to the narrative, Chinese government is not the government like, you know, we know, you and I know, publicly go out and, and tell their uh, constituents and their citizens, uh, policy X, policy Y didn't work, they need to look at the other part. That's not what you, that's not what we should expect. Therefore, yeah. we would not know how effective the, the sanction has been. But when you look at the economic slowdown, when you look at the belligerent public statements, you can tell for sure. And also the third, I will stop after this. The, after Putin invaded Ukraine in a short than, uh, less than a week period, more than 100 global brands either stopped their practices or suspended. This is a bad news for the Chinese. It shows that international community, when shove comes to push, uh, they can come together. So, so you have to look at individual countries differently. And this sanction does not affect the ordinary people in China because ordinary people are not the beneficiary. Yeah. Uh, Chinese don't call them an oligarch, but they have a, something called princeling. They have a yeah. group of billionaires benefiting from the Chinese economic system, much like the Putin's oligarchs benefited from the Russia's economic sure. system. To, to what extent, um, you know, you talked about public outrage in, in, in Western countries or in countries with democratic governments, people have access to this information, although I would, I would say the access that we do have, the awareness that we do have about this genocide is still very, very limited. What about within China itself, Han Chinese? Are there activists or leaders or even people in the business community? I'm thinking about, say, somebody like... Um, uh, Weibo or an artist, a celebrity, a uh, athlete, any kind of conversation or, um, you know, civic discourse about what's happening with the Uyghurs? Um, 
I don't think that, you know, it, it's, it's a very, very important question. And I get this question a lot, but um, here's how I would explain. Um, I don't think that even the Chinese people, ordinary people know what is happening to the Uyghurs. They may not be in line to care. And yeah. now the question becomes, after Shanghai lockdown, um, reportedly 41 cities, about 290 million people, that is um, about one third of the Chinese workforce, currently being under lockdown. They may be having uh, different thoughts now because this government can surveil you. They can put you in a, um, in a, uh, in a, um, a, a, a guarded environment. Yes. So the so the Chinese people may have been uh, start thinking uh, about something different. But here's the interesting aspect of the Chinese society: the Chinese Communist Party adopted a capitalism, the ideology of its force merely as a weapon to save itself from the Soviet Union, a Soviet-style collapse, as I profiled in the book. But it also had adopted into uh, a new model that an increasing number of authoritarian regimes now thought to em emulate. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, their system, their governance is is, is ex actually um, becoming a kind of a popular uh, 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 system for some countries. Um, so, it, it, so through this Orwellian system of oppression and brainwashing uh, and state control, the Chinese created this fear uh, in, in some ordinary people. And they also favored a group of uh, uh, Chinese citizens, Chinese individuals, and allowing them to become a very rich people who can uh, charter two airplanes as the book Red Roulette uh, described for wine tasting uh, in, in France, uh, shopping spheres in Los Angeles, uh, or come and going all the way to Paris to buy lots of stuff. So essentially, the, the Chinese have created this, this confusing uh, living environment so the, the citizens can dance and, and do uh, post funny clips on and video, video mm -hmm. uh, and become extremely wealthy, but never question the Communist Party because the life is too good for them. Yeah. So they yeah, don't yeah. want to be subject to the Orwellian uh, side instantly kicks uh, when it kicks in. So this is actually written by a Chinese uh, 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 author in 2018, he said, I will, I'm going to quote for you, living in China is confusing now because it can feel like being in North Korea and the United States at the same time. Mm. That description is, is riveting. Exactly. This is precisely why you don't see any citizen activism. Uh, the, you know, the, for, for the people who live in the big cities, the life is too good and the others mm -hmm. don't have access uh, like the others do. So, yeah, yeah it, sure. it's, a, it's a problem for the Chinese in the long term. Well, I want to thank you for your time. I know that your book is just out, so you're doing a lot of interviews. Really grateful for the time that you have given us. Um, I'm going to continue to uh, follow your work, and I highly recommend your book because it's, a, even though it's such a painful topic, a very enjoyable read. Thank you again for being with us, everybody. Thank you, Nuri. Thank you, Miriam. Wish you the best. Thank you.